Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we continue our study dealing with uh, laying out the lines in Judges. So can we begin with a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful uh, to be able to gather each morning to open your word, uh, to receive the light that you have for us for the present time. And uh, we are thankful for the responsibilities that you have given us in spite of the fact that uh, we are frail humans, but it gives us an opportunity to connect with you each day and to cooperate with Christ in the work of saving souls. And so we just pray, Lord, that you can use us, that you can help us, give us strength for all that we are doing. We ask that you can help us understand these lines and that we can prepare for the camp meeting in six short months. Um, we know, Lord, that uh, much rests upon um, on how we respond to this light and how we listen to your voice. And so we just ask that um, as we spend time with you each day, that you can strengthen us and guide us on the correct course. Be with each person um, watching these videos. And we just ask, Lord, that you can be with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so we, we've started laying out these lines, and I'm going to explain a little bit um, what exactly it is we're doing. So we've been looking at Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, and then, of course, Deborah and Barak. And I went over some of the older videos that we did when we first went through the book of Judges. And um, I'll show you what I found. So when we had drawn out this Judges line, we had started on this understanding that our line, uh, the, the Judges line, goes from 9-11 to 2023, and that we were addressing with these first three judges, Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, um, errors that had been left over uh, from Adventism that had still permeated the mo movement that needed to be addressed before this message could be formalized. Now, we didn't quite put it that way, but... Um, we had started drawing out this line, and we we had looked really just at the arrival of the first angel, and then the second angel and the third angel. We had laid out a basic line. Now, what we had done is we had said that Othniel uh, is 9/11, but we looked at 9/11 in two different ways. We have 9/11 that is um, the arrival of the first, or, or the empowerment of the first angel, and also 9/11 represents. Uh, the arrival of the second angel. And then we had, um, this is back in June, um, then we had taken these two 9-11s and we placed Othniel at the second 9-11, that is the 9-11 that has to do, that is this, uh, this then is a zoom in into not the first 9-11, the empowerment of the first angel, but the arrival of the second angel. That's how we looked at it back in June. And so I've struggled with these two different ways of looking at, at um, this history. history. Um, so what had we decided about this um, in the last couple of studies dealing with how do we look at the judges line? It's a zoom into what way, Mark? It's definitely a zoom into 9-11. We agreed upon that. Is 
Does anybody remember how we how we came to understand this? So what would be the case for saying that this judge's line is a zoom into 9-11 as represented by the arrival of the second angel? What would be the argument for that? Anybody have thoughts on that? I'm still trying to remember what we, you know, all of that that we went over and I'd stepped away for just a brief moment. So. Okay. So it's just simply, we know that our line is, is leading up to the predict. Our line is about the prediction before midnight. Correct. Now um, that is our line is not a zoom into the midnight way mark. It just leads to it. But it, it is a zoom into a way mark on the bigger line. So when we have this bigger line above our line, um, we, we can look at our line and we, we can say all that we're experiencing of our whole line, that is from 1989 to the Sunday law, is a zoom into the Sunday law. That is our history of this movement, starting with Jeff in 1989. Uh, goes up to the Sunday law. That is, our whole line is a zoom into the Sunday law on Ellen White's line, right? On the, the biggest line that we have uh, from Millerite history, right? So we're taking our Millerite line. It's extended all the way to the Sunday law, close of probation, the seven last plagues, the second coming. This is all that the Millerites foresaw. And so we have coming on that line, a Sunday law. But we know that our line is a zoom into that. 9-11 itself, uh, we see as the arrival of the angel of Revelation 18, right? So the mighty angel of Revelation 18 coming down, what we sometimes call the fourth angel, even though it's really the second angel. So the second angel arrives at 9-11. But in that whole line, which is a zoom into the Sunday law, we, we also include 1989. Now, we saw that Jeff continued to zoom into these lines without recognizing what he was doing. That is, uh, having this bigger line with 1989, Sunday law, and close of probation uh, with a loud cry after the Sunday law um, was just the first step in, in connecting this repeat of history with Ellen White's line. But as we continue to unseal the seven thunders, we came to understand Millerite history and saw more and more waymarks. But these waymarks allowed us to zoom in. And so we, at least I've struggled. Maybe other people have struggled with it as well. But the thing that I've struggled with is what exactly is line, what line we are on when we're talking about a line. And people often ask me these questions, uh, you know, when was midnight or when is midnight or was this event midnight or the midnight cry, right? Uh, because we have 11.9, for instance, as being midnight and we have had, which would be Raphia, and we have had a July 18th as being Paneum and sometimes December 25th as being Paneum. So, so we've had these different, um, these way marks labeled differently. And when they're labeled differently, that means we're on a different line. So here we can have 9-11 being labeled as the arrival of the first angel. But the question is, what 9-11? So we, we know that 
we have one event, but it has two different uh, purposes, right? So it it was definitely uh, the empowerment of the first angel. But as this movement began to zoom in, we saw that it was also the arrival of the second angel. But that means that was actually a separate line. Correct? Right. Okay. But we didn't know that. We didn't know it was a separate line. We just knew that it served both purposes. And, and I don't think we've quite, um, you know, parsed out that line exactly to see why that is. But, um, and, and, and because we have had, um, we'll call it misinformation, uh, regarding our lines presented by people like Parminder, things that brought confusion to the movement regarding the lines. And um, because we ourselves are passing through these lines and there are multiple lines, it's been really hard for us to distinguish exactly what line we're looking at when we're looking at an event or a line. Right, so we're looking at a way mark and we're saying, well, what is this way mark? Um, and if we don't know what line we're on, then it's it's difficult to discern. So when we so when we um, first went through Judges chapter uh, chapter three, and we looked at Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, we chose to put Othniel as the the arrival of the second angel. And so an argument for that would be that our movement is about the second angel's message. Right? But when we're doing that, we have to be quite clear which line we're on. So when we did that, um, we, had, we didn't have all these, you know, empowerment of the first angel and all that on the line. We just started looking at the fact that we had this darkness this error, these errors uh, that existed in um, that we inherited from Adventism and that we had to address in this movement if we were going to move forward. Now, in 2005, and we mark here the, the understanding of the 2520. Right? So I th think there's some dis disagreement on how to date that, but you know whether it's the end of 2004, the beginning of 2005. Um, but we have the 2520, and we start to have, even though we had understood the charts before, the charts start to become more prominent. Um, and so we could take that story of Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, and we can zoom into that. That is this uh, way mark of 9-11 and create a whole other way mark, like a whole other line with Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar being the first, second, and third angels messages. That's not what we originally did. Uh, we, just, we just put 2005 and 2014 because we were looking at this as our history of our line unfolds. And so... <clears throat> I know we go through this again and again, but every time we go through it, we see a bit more. So we could look at each of these dates that we have on this line, and we can say, well, these are the way marks overall in our movement from 9-11 to 2023. And so, so we're in a sense defining a line that has to do with our movement. And um, we know though that each of these has um, connected to it uh, judges. And so we're looking at the judges as representing these way marks, which we would call righteousness. And each of these judges, of course, is responding to an oppression. And so those oppressions would be periods of darkness. And so, so these judges themselves um, must have a reform line. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to 
look at Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. But if we're looking Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, and we're going to say that they're, they're a line, and we look at this 9-11, the question is, um, is this the second angel? So arriving, and the argument for that would be that our movement is not so much about the empowerment of the first angel, but our movement is now about the, the arrival of the second angel. So we're zoomed into the second 9-11, so to speak. Anybody have questions about that? Now, the other thing is, if we looked at it as being the empowerment of the first angel, we do know that it's in that history after 9-11 that they first have to come to understand that 9-11 is the empowerment of the first angel, right? But um, in, in doing that, uh, If it's the empowerment of the first angel, would that, how would we understand that, that history where they're going to sort that out? Because they're going to sort that out when? When are they going to have it sorted out that 9-11 is the empowerment of the first angel? Because they're not going to have that in 2001. So what year did we figure that they came to understand that? Around 2006, 2007. Okay. So it's going to be about 2006, 2007. So it, it takes them a while, right? Now, they're first going to understand um, some things about 9-11 by 2000, late 2003, right? I believe it is. I don't think it's early 2003. So, so why does it take them so long to understand 9-11? For them. FFA, Jeff. Yeah, it wasn't until, I think it was Russell Williams, um, that he saw more significance than 9-11. I think I... Uh, might have been around the time of the ozone meeting or That's later than that. Yeah, so it's connected with the ozone meetings. Um, so we've got Russell Williams, he's been talking to Jeff. So so they start to they start to get some ideas about what 9-11 meant. Um, weren't there always doubters in that were distracting? Well, yeah, all through this history of, of Jeff's uh, message, as new light came, um, there was definitely battles going on over what what Jeff was teaching. So people, there's always been the grumblers in the movement. Um, and the doubters. And the doubters. Well, I'd look at more at the, the grumblers. Okay. Uh, they're, the, they're the troublemakers. You know, people can doubt things, but unless they start grumbling um, and creating problems. So from the time I came into the movement in 2010, I would always hear people complaining about Jeff in one way or another, mm -hmm. sometimes a little more openly, sometimes a little more um, subversively. But um, so we know in, it's in this history, 2004, to 2006, 2007, that they really start to get a grasp of this way mark, 9-11. And, and um, eventually what, what he's going to do is he's going to have, instead of 1989 as being his first way mark, he's going to start putting 9-11 as the first way mark. So we're going to have a line that goes 9-11, 
uh, Sunday law. I'm trying to think exactly how he moves that around because I know he first starts 1989 Sunday law close of probation. And, and what he eventually does is get rid of 1989 and replace 911 in there. And, and people start accusing him of moving the waymarks. So, but what's happening is he's zooming into some kind of line. And so initially, when they have 911, we could probably create a line and we have it. But there is a line that addresses the empowerment of the first angel. And I don't think that this judge's line does that. But I've I've hemmed and hawed about it, been back and forth in my mind about it. Now, some people may say, well, why does it matter? And so why does it matter? I mean, 9-11 is a singular event. Why was it, would it matter if I'm zooming into 9-11 as the empowerment of the first angel with this judge's line, or I'm zooming into 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel? Why would that matter? It should be a simple question to answer. There are two different lines. Okay, so there are two different lines. So I need to know what line I'm in. So remember, we have this line where um, we have 1989. We have um, the formalization of the message in 1996. And then we have the, the empowerment of the first angel at 9-11. And, and then there was this, this controversy going on in this movement regarding these lines as we started to, uh, in 2016 specifically, but even, even a bit before that. But in 2016 specifically, once we had the first day of the first month, the fifth day of the fourth month, the first day of the fifth month and the 10th day of the seventh month, we now had instead of three way marks on our line that we normally would look at as the first, second, and third way mark, we now had this first, and then we had midnight, midnight crime. We, we made midnight this tiny little tick compared to the taller way marks um, in 2016. But midnight and midnight cry were a double way mark. And so, so they really were one way mark, but later on, we just started writing them all equal. Um, and then we had, of course, still this Sunday law uh, looking ahead so that our line was moving towards the Sunday law. And sometimes I would draw the lines with it, like an arrow showing that they're, they're going this direction uh, to the right, you know, so they're going forward in time but um because i understood that the lines are leading somewhere and and really they're leading to that third way mark that is the sunday law the arrival of the third angel um but it, which is also the empower empowerment of the third angel so there's so as we deal with all these different lines as we look at um these lines, what, what we had the problem with is, um, and I guess maybe because we could deal with the problems that, um, okay, Mark Bruce, what was Mark Bruce doing that was disturbing 9-11? What did Mark Bruce say, if anybody remembers? What was his issue? And anybody remember? Stephen, you should remember. Why did he diminish 
we, we need to know this history. Nobody knows, eh? So it had to do with the unfolding of light. So there was a number of things. He had these 10 way marks. He had the cross. So he'd have seven, then the cross, and then three. Um, and so in 2016, there was this issue regarding uh, these way marks. Is this room anybody? Anybody remember what this is about? Okay. So we need to. Okay, so this is um, following the ordination of the three elders. So this is in 2019. Um, this is a future newsletter. So let me see. This is issued in August. Um, So this is, so let's take a look at this here. So this is just prior to Jeff waking up. So, you know, take that into account here. And the first article is going to be by Tabo. And Tabo is going to go through this history, right? So this is Tabo's perspective. And so he says, following the ordination of the three elders, strange developments began to be seen in relation to Mark Bruce, who was formerly a member of staff at the Arkansas School of the Prophets. Upon returning to Europe, Bruce started his own ministry, Tree of Life, and began the work of traveling to teach whatever groups were willing to give him an audience. In the course of time, concerns began to be sounded about the initially subtle but increasingly divergent trajectory tra 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 trajectory of his teachings these doctrinal differences and various inter interpersonal matters were the subject of and the justification for a series of meetings that took place in wales in the month of december 2016 these meetings were attended by elders pippinger by barrios uh, however you say tavo's last name manjit and emma byant were also in attendance as well as mark bruce it became evident at those meetings that Bruce was presenting a new prophetic model whose conclusions were divergent from understandings that were foundational to the movement from its early years. Not only this, but it became clear that Bruce did not recognize the ordination of the three elders as he was of the belief that Elder Pippinger was in apostasy. It followed from that belief that the three elders were ordained by unsanctified hands and thus were not recognized by God, etc., etc. So um, so the way that Tabo sees this is this was an attack upon the organization. Now, he's not going to go here into uh, the details of exactly what happened. So he just talks about these doctrinal differences and this divergence. Okay, so now we – so – these doctrinal differences and we'll try to find some more specifics here is any of this coming back to people's minds i don't want to get this wrong so i'm going to try to find i don't think you're getting it wrong i mean the situation at that time and I'll, I'll speak for myself, was that there was 
very little that I observed, especially with what was going on with Parminder and Tabo, because mm-hmm. I was having a hard enough time comprehending what I was being told from FFA because they were wanting people to listen to these other presentations at a very high speed. And that was occurring at that point in time in 2019 as well. Yeah. So what you're talking about here, especially with what Tabo and those others in Canada were releasing was something that was not, I don't think generally addressed. Yeah. So I know there was a diminu- diminution, diminu. Anyway, he made diminution. Little- it, it, it diminished it. Yeah, he diminished 9 11 in that he believed that errors had come in. And, and I agree actually with some of the ideas that Mark Bruce had because um, we can see this quite clearly. He was correct about what was happening. So um, there was a lot of misinformation regarding what Mark Bruce was doing and saying, right? So there was, um, I mean, I don't know, I wasn't at the meeting in Wales and how this happened, but definitely Mark Bruce did not accept the ordination of the elders um, because he saw them as teaching error and he was at odds with them. But I don't think he did the right thing and how he dealt with it. But, you know, hindsight's 50-50. So, um, you know, what would have happened otherwise? Uh, but also he had, had, I mean, there definitely was personal problems going on, all these types of things. So um, when we look at... Um, Um, I'm just trying to find something here. So these old, I'm trying to look through these. Yeah, so they, they got rid of some of their old articles. Um, yeah, so the Tree of Life, their web- websites got rid of some of their old stuff. Unfortunately, people do that all the time. Um, and just trying to see if they say anything about 9 11 now on their site. Um, so I think they just pretty much got rid of that way mark. Um, let me see if I can find anything here. Uh, I just ended up going in a bit different direction than I originally had planned. Okay, so we got a little bit in one of these articles. Um, so this is, uh, I'm not sure when this one was published, but... Uh, Okay, so he does have some stuff. So what they believed that that 9-11 was prefiguring the punishment that would come upon those who chose Sunday over the true Sabbath. So the first quote from Testimonies, Volume 9, page 11, is marking the time of the end and points forward to a time where the Lord will punish them for accepting the false Sabbath. The point in 1989 that marks the time of the end was where communism, the South, collapsed. That began on the 9th of November, 9-11, at midnight, when the wall came down in Germany, supposedly freeing those in the Soviet-controlled regions from their slavery. Uh, Who was looked upon as their savior? The Pope, right? So that's what he does with 9-11. And now there's more to it. Um, But he's going to take 9-11. And see, this isn't really wrong. Does 9-11 prefigure the Sunday law?
I would say yes. Yeah. So, but what he was having the problems was the same problem all of us were having is we didn't understand that there were separate lines that were zooms into of these various waymarks that were now unfolding before us. And, you know, if we had patiently uh, spent the time following the counsel that Ellen White gives regarding how we deal with those who differ, and instead of attacking them, uh, work with them, that is labor for them, take time to study what they're presenting, uh, things would work out differently. Sometimes we cause the very rebellion, Ella White says, that we're professing to fight against. So by how we deal with people, we can create rebellion in them. And then uh, what we criticize that person about, they in a sense become, right? So I'm not saying that you know, I know better what Jeff should have done or what other people should have done because I wasn't there. Um, I'm only in a sense an outsider looking in. Um, but I do know that um, there were things said about Mark Bruce that weren't necessarily true. And even though there was problems, uh, those problems become, became exacerbated by uh, the way that it was dealt with. And, and often it's the rumors and gossip that are uh, become this, that become truth um, that becomes a real issue. So, um, so we can see that 9-11 from Mark Bruce's perspective just becomes a type, um, but it is a type. So, so he starts to see that we're moving into another line um, but he doesn't see it as another line. He just sees, well, this other line is 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 just typical, which which of course it is. Um, but we are moving into a line where um, 9/11 is now serving a different purpose, right? And that is, it's not just the empowerment of the first angel; it's the arrival of the second. Now, Chawatu introduced 2014 as sunset. Now, in doing that, if we look at 9-11 as the empowerment of the first angel, can we not see that 2014 can be an application of April 11th, 2019? That Chow Tu was not wrong when he said, that we can take um, the first day of the first month and place it at 2014. I thought we'd already established that. Yeah, that we have, but I'm just reviewing this, right? Sure. So that so that would be a separate line. That would be 9-11 is the empowerment of the first angel. And 2014 is the first day of the first month in that particular line. Right. So so we haven't really determined exactly what line that is. Um, now, in 2014, don't we first come to understand the first day of the first month? I think we have the inkling of it. I think, you know, it's it's almost like it arrives. Well, yeah. So in 2013, we we started looking at the first day of the first month uh, and the first day of the fifth month to try to determine that. But it's going to be at the camp meeting in 2014. Um, I believe it's the, I don't know if it's the June 22nd camp meeting or some earlier one, but Noel's going to present um, that the first day of the fifth month is August 15th and the first day of the first month is April 19th and et cetera. So that's going to be in 2014. So in 2013, we're going to have, uh, of course, the idea introduced from Emiliano, just the whole idea that we can look at the first day of the first month and the first day of the fifth month 
and then try to determine those in 1844, right? So, so we have them in, in Miller in 457 BC. And, and the Millerites had understood about the first day of the first month and the first day of the fifth month in uh, 457 BC, but they hadn't applied it to their history. And so this is what Emiliano is going to introduce, but it's going to be become knowledge in the movement in 2014. So, so 2014 in some line, whatever line that is, uh, becomes sunset. <clears throat> okay, so I, th I think it's becoming clearer as we, we examine these lines, what's happening. Now, I'm going to go... Um, here. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create this new line. So I'm going to get rid of all of this. So this is just another another line. Is that the line I wanted? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to take Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. And um, so we're going to create a whole new line with them. So right now we've got them all sort of at this first way mark. And we say that Othniel is the Holy Spirit and that this is a work of repentance that's going to happen with Othniel. And... Um, This, this happens at 9-11, that this message begins. And then we're going to take each of these. So here I'm just going to, so we're not. So we got Ehud is going to be the second angel's message. Now obviously the dates are going to be a little bit different here. And then we're going to have Shamgar. So when we looked at this line above here and we just said Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar are this history in the movement. Um, and then we actually put like Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar as these three different waymarks. So 2005 is going to deal with Ehud and then Shamgar is going to be uh, 2014. That's how, how we did it. And Shamgar is going to represent... Um, what happens in 2014, which is a number of things. Uh, it's going to be the first day of the first month being understood and the first day of the fifth month being understood. Plus also we're going to have in uh, the fall camp meeting, we're going to have in, in Arkansas, uh, the presentations on chronology, the structure of prophetic chronology, as I understood it back in 2014. So the, some of these things that have been expanded upon. But in 2014, we're gonna introduce this, this new revised uh, chronology to the movement. So lots of little details were wrong, but the basic idea uh, is there, even the 390 and 40 uh, days of Ezekiel's prophecy are there, plus a lot of these other structures and they're just going to be expanded upon. So sort of a foundation was laid there. Now, if we look at it in this line, in the judges line, um, and we just place them here, we can see that this is all about an increase of light, right? So the message is going to be formalized when we end up with this time, right? So this line is going to be about time, correct? The 2520, the first day of the first month, first day of the fifth month. Exactly. Technology in general. And so this line addresses time. And so whatever this judge's line is, it's about this movement that has time related to it. And, and this is, in some ways, we can say that this whole line is really a Jotham, right? Because Jotham is snow. 
And so this is all really about like Samuel Snow's letters, things like that, right? So, but just to kind of simplify the whole idea is that we're, this is a zoom in to the arrival of the second angel, which is, you know, the first day of the first month. And, and, and all of these judges are now going to expand upon that, how this movement, the part it has to play in this development of the second angel's message in history. So Jeff primarily had to deal with the first angel's message. And so 9-11 for him was this empowerment of the first angel's message. But then he's still in the movement and he starts to see this second angel coming down at 9-11. So that's going to be understood uh, progressively in this movement. Now, particularly when that starts to be understood, um, uh, you know, we, we can see the beginnings of it in, you know, 2004. They first have to understand it as empowerment. But I specifically remember when he brought the two together, and that's going to be after the camp meeting in 2014. He's going to start to see that a little bit, um, but it's going to, the movement is going to start to understand that these two messages are combined, right? Not recognizing that they're two separate lines. Um, so when we, we deal with Othniel, um, Ehud, and Shamgar, and we put them on a line, we need to recognize that on a line them themselves they can illustrate the bigger line right so even though in this history they're connected with the arrival of the second angel on the other line which we're going to call the arrival of the first angel right so they're going to be at 9 11 but they're going to be at 9 11 within this movement so 9 11 serves a a purpose in a bigger line but in this line 9-11 is, is going to be about time, the beginning of this, this issue dealing with time. And Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar are these messages that are going to correct our understanding as Seventh-day Adventists, uh, that barrier that Adventists have had uh, to understanding time after October 22nd, 1844. That is, time exists but it doesn't exist in the time setting that Ellen White condemns. So what this movement is doing in this history is, is recognizing that for us, time is, is, is happening, but we're not going to have a proclamation message of time. And one of the things that happens in this movement is, that's interesting is the movement, which, which was re very controversial in 2014, um, was the idea of no more public evangelism. Right? Now, why would that be important in relationship to us having this message on time? But we also have no more public evangelism. I've looked at it and you know, had to consider if I'm incorrect that we first needed to understand the message because if we're only giving bits and pieces that can be misunderstood, then that can do more harm than good. Right. So, and, and I've noticed personally um, that, you know, because I labor for people all the time, uh, that God, I believe, left a lot of people out of the movement who who weren't, weren't ready for what the movement is about. That is, this is an internal work within the movement and it relates to time because we're repeating Millerite history and we have to pass through that experience. So we're not giving a time proclamation. Even when we did July 18, 2020, uh, the reason we gave that message was because we believed that Nashville was gonna be attacked by a nuclear weapon. And it could have even been the case that we diverted that from occurring, we don't we don't know for certain. We do know that um, people in in the American government, the 
the, the security aspect of the United States knew because of one of our members who was connected to them, knew about what the movement was saying about July 18th. Um, and of course, that's very logical. The, could you imagine, I mean, if you have a group predicting an attack, doesn't matter how crazy you may think them to be, that the American government's going to look at it, right? I mean, that's just what they do. They, they have their ear to the ground and everything that they... Uh, anything that might appear to be a threat, even if it's very minor, they're going to look at, it, right? So uh, whether they diverted an attack in some way, maybe even just the proclamation that this would occur, delayed it in some way, we don't know. But um, this was not an evangelistic uh, process in warning Nashville, right? So we weren't using it as part of our message of warning to the world. Um, we weren't using this in an evangelistic way. It was just a warning, right? So all of this time that we've been given has been given to us to do an internal work. And, and that became really clear to me once we started talking about time. And, and the reason why it was clear to me had to do with all of the work that I'd done with chronology to that point so and and my whole experience in dealing with uh time setting so so in 2018 i'm going to be pretty clear that uh this is internal november 9th 2019 is internal but when we get to the july 18 date it becomes much more um evocative as far as thinking that we might be able to predict an attack on the United States. So definitely I have a part to play in that, in suggesting that that may be what this is pointing to. But I also did it on a different basis. I still believe that it had to do with things that were happening in the movement internally and that external events could witness to internal events. So so if we're going to take this line then, um, and I'm just going to get rid of all these dates just so they don't confuse us. Just put whatever. So if we're going to take the message of Othniel, Othniel then is going to be a work of the Holy Spirit. And um, it's against the two errors. Right. Now, one of the things that we discussed back in June of last year was um, that that this is Mesopotamia. Right. So that is Kush Rash Kushan Rishathayim. He's the king of Mesopotamia. And that's between the two rivers the Euphrates and the Tigris. And what do the Euphrates and the Tigris, um, what's the significance of them prophetically? Well, you had uh, Daniel's prophecies native with them rivers. Okay, so can you specifically tell me which ones? Pitical Uli. Okay, now the Hittical and the Uli are not the Euphrates and the Tigris. Okay. So the Uli... I can, I, I'm, I go ahead. Yeah, so the Uli is in Persia. Right? So that's going to be in in the capital there of, of Medo-Persia. Um the name of well, El El Elmay says they are the great rivers of Shinar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you think of Shinar, that's going to be the the Tigris and Euphrates is the great rivers. Yeah. But the Uli, if if it was that river, it wasn't really that great compared to the other rivers. Okay. Now. Um... So I spent a bit of time looking into this. So when Ellen White makes that statement, uh, she's actually quoting someone else. 
Anybody know who she's quoting? I don't recall. Was it Uriah Smith? No, the non Adventist. Oh. Would that be Hyssop? No, Hyssop didn't exist yet. I'm trying to find it here. I can't remember the guy's name. Um, anyway, the guy who she's quoting it's non-Adventist. And, and so I spent some time trying to figure out what he's talking about. And, and he's definitely not referring to the Tigris in the U, Euphrates. Right? So he understands that the Uli is a river of Shinar. And now, okay, so these are Daniel chapter... Um, so in Daniel chapter 10, you're going to have, um, where's this here? Where does it say? Yeah, he's by the Hittakil. So the Hittakil is the Tigris, right? We all agree upon that? I would say yes. Yes. Here, I'll just share the screen. All right. So it's going to say uh, the great river, which is Hittakel, right? And then in Daniel chapter 8 is where he has the vision by the Uli, right? Now, where is he when he has this vision? Is he not by the Uli in Shushan? He, he's in vision by the Uli, isn't he? Yeah, but he's also in Shushan. And, and Shushan, the palace, does that exist in the third year of the reign of Belshazzar? Is he not by the Uli and then in vision? He's taken to Shushan. Okay, but he can't be in Uli when he's in the third year of the reign of Belshazzar. Right? So this is going to be uh, approximately five years after Nebuchadnezzar dies, something like that. So this is early on in Belshazzar's reign. Right. Okay. So, so this third year of the reign of Belshazzar is long before Persia comes along. Okay. Yes. Okay. And also Shushan the palace does not exist at this time. So when he's brought in vision to Shushan the palace by the river of Uli, he's brought into the future. Okay? Now, he may not have known that when it happened, but when he writes the book of Daniel, it's going to be in the time of Persia, and he would recognize where he had been in vision earlier. Right. So he's he's actually in the future here in vision. Does that make sense? Yes, because we had sort of connected that to being like John being taken in the wilderness. In the 1260. Yeah. Yeah. 1798. 
And so, like, Daniel is, in a sense, taken to 457. Yeah, so he's taken to 457. I mean, that's what we would have to agree on. So he's get being brought to the beginning of the 2300 days. So he, he's brought into something in the future, something that didn't exist when he had this vision. And so the ULI here has to be uh, not, well, it's definitely not the Euphrates. And, and never has that um, uh, name attached to it. So, so Ellen White's statement is about these great rivers. Uli is a great river, so is the Tigris. Now, when we talk about Sh Shinar, um, how often do we have Shinar mentioned in the Bible? Where is it mentioned? Isn't it mentioned in Genesis? Yeah. So it's going to be mentioned in Genesis a few times. Um, is, uh, Zechariah chapter 5. Yeah. Isaiah 11.11. 11. Um, Daniel, of course, chapter 1. It's going to mention Shinar because um, they're going to be carried to Babylon. Right. And, and in Zechariah 5.11. Right. So... So Shinar is going to first show up in Genesis 10.10, 10, uh, talking about Nimrod. The beginning of his kingdom was Bethel and Eric and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. So there has been debate about what Shinar refers to. Uh, I don't think that it is a synonym for Mesopotamia, that it would refer to, uh, to Babylon, which is in the south, and to the area that's occupied by Persia. So we just sometimes think, well, Shinar, that's Babylon. We think about this whole area of Mesopotamia. But this is, and Shinar uh, um, means, uh, I was trying to remember, just make sure I get this. Um, it's here, it means country of two rivers. So. It, it has a, in, in this definition here, Brown Driver's Brig, that's what it says it means. But we know we have Mesopotamia is also the land of two rivers. And so um, we could see that Tigris and Uli are also two rivers. And it would naturally be that we would confound the two, right? Correct. Okay. So Ellen White would be correct in her statement about Shinar. The problem is our understanding of Shinar. That is, we we just have associated it with Mesopotamia because it's also the land of two rivers. Does that make sense? So. So if we go back to the issue that that came up with um, uh, Tess, so what she was saying is that there were these two streams. There is the um, two rivers, so to speak, right? And uh, the good stream was CNN, MSNBC, all those, and then the bad one was Fox. And what was the problem with her understanding? Just from a prophetic point of view, not from a... Because what had Jeff pointed out regarding these streams in his Time of the End magazine, these rivers? One had to do with the uh, lake of fire. The other one had to do with 
worldwide proclamation. Okay. In, in Time of the End magazine, he it starts out with the tale of two rivers, right? That's going to be the Euphrates and the Tigris. Now, yeah. Jeff is going to understand that that's Ellen White's reference to the U line, the Hittacle is a reference to the Tigris and the Euphrates. So, Jeff, like many of us, have not understood uh, the two visions and their their reference, but the idea, the illustration is still correct, right? There's a tale of two rivers, and and those two rivers. How did Jeff understand them? What did he understand them to be in the time of the end magazine? I just thought it was one was the uh, lake of fire and the other one was yeah okay the gospel okay so so he's gonna have um, okay let's go time of the end let's see if I can find this magazine because because we went through this right at the beginning of our examination of the foundation. Okay, I have to find this somewhere else. So, so what was what was the problem that Tess had with these streams of knowledge, information? So, we'll discuss that while I'm finding these here. The second one that's going to have it. It's going to be number two. Anyway, people have to comment here. So I'm, I'm looking at the original articles um, just because I like them better, but uh, it's not the first one. Ten virgins. Okay. So what's wrong with what Tess was saying? Can somebody tell me? What's wrong with the Fox MSNBC thing? She was always lifting up a more, say, politicized message rather than that which we should be taking from Scripture. Okay, well, that's that's definitely true. Um, what else? I mean, I'm thinking more prophetically. Obviously, what she was teaching was error.
this being the first one. Prophetically, what's the problem? Isn't she setting aside many of the way marks that we have been established? Okay. She so, was, she was saying, yeah, go on. She was saying that one was a good stream and one was a bad stream when they were both bad. Okay. So one's the good stream, one's the bad stream. They're both bad. And um, so let's see what Jeff says here. Um, so Ellen White identifies this twofold message. So, um, so I'm going to go back here. So a twofold story within this setting, uh, the prophetess points us to the climax of Daniel 11, and she brings together a description of a twofold bittersweet end time events. When she states, it is impossible to give any idea of the experience of the people of God who shall be alive on earth. When celestial glory and a repetition of persecutions of the past are blended. Two stories are ahead of God's people. The story of the glory which attends those who demonstrate and defend the truth in this final hour of earth's history. And the story of the apostate forces which seek to oppose the truth at the end of the world. Ellen White identifies the twofold message in another place while once again pointing us to the 11th chapter of Daniel. The light that Daniel received from God was given especially for these last days. The visions he saw by the banks of the Uli in the Hittico. So that's the Uli in Persia, the Hittico in, in Babylon, the Tigris. The great rivers of Shinar are now in process of fulfillment, and all the events foretold will soon come to pass. So... Um, the vision on the banks of the Uli, Jeff says, is the vision of Daniel 8, and the only part of the vision by the Uli which had not been fulfilled when Sister White made this statement was Daniel 8.14, which began its fulfillment in 1844. However, it was, and still is, in process of fulfillment. When the Uli flows into the sea, it ceases to exist. Likewise, when Christ finishes his work, in the most holy place, the message of the everlasting gospel has finished its course. They, they are those who follow Christ's work in the most holy place, whom Daniel sees purified and made white and tried. While John sees them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass. Daniel 12.10, Revelation 15.2. The vision which was now in the process of fulfillment that was given to Daniel by the Hittico is the vision of the last six verses of Daniel 11. The only part of Daniel 11, which was as yet unfulfilled, when the Hittico flows into the sea, it ceases to exist. So too, when the king of the north comes to his end and none shall help, Daniel's testimony of Babylon has finished its course. John also sees the end of Babylon as the beast is taken and with him the false prophet and cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. Revelation 19 verse 20. Two rivers headed in two totally different bodies of water. The Uli with the river of life to the sea of glass. The Hittico with the foul Euphrates to the lake of fire. The visions by these two rivers present both the story of the redeemed and the story of the lost. As these rivers flow into the sea, their messages cross the boundary line of human probation, forever separating the righteous and the wicked. Um, oh, oh, who will describe to you the lamentations that will arise when at the boundary line which parts time and eternity the righteous judge will lift up his voice and declare it is too late. Long have the wide gates of heaven stood open and the heavenly messengers have invited and entreated. Whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. But at length, the mandate goes forth. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. 
Sister White informs us that the books of Daniel and Revelation complement each other. Um, in the Revelation, all the books of the Bible meet and end. Here is the complement of the book of Daniel. One is a prophecy, the other a revelation. The book that was sealed is not the Revelation, but that portion of the prophecy of Daniel relating to the last days. The angel commanded, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Daniel and Revelation complement one another in many areas, including the messages of the two rivers, which are used to identify the last twofold message in the book of Daniel. These rivers also find symbolic counterparts in the two rivers of Revelation. There we find the river of life conveying the promise of life to those who accept the everlasting gospel, while we also see the dried up Euphrates illustrating the bankruptcy of the worship of Babylon. If we partake of the water of life, we are to call those who are drinking the foul waters of the Euphrates to flee from the broken cisterns to fall in Babylon. The book of Daniel contains the final message of warning for this last hour of Earth's history. This final message, symbolized in the visions of, by the banks of the Hittical and Uli rivers, identify both the false worship of the king um, of the king, and we've got to go down here, king of the north. Oh, I see we kind of skipped these this part here. Um, anyway, so we have so what is Jeff saying here? And how does this not agree with what Tess was doing? Now, now we have to know that Jeff still confounded um, or conflated the, uh, he got confused regarding these rivers, but it still holds out what he's saying because he's primarily here talking about uh, the messages of Daniel 8 and Daniel uh, chapter 11, of course, 10 to 12. Um, so there are two different rivers So, so what's going on in this story? In Jeff's, in Jeff's understanding, what is he presenting? What does Daniel 8 represent? What does Daniel 11 represent? Isn't Daniel 8 representing a message for God's people and Daniel 11 showing them what's going to happen with those that are not of God's people? Right. So, so they're both prophecies dealing with the close of probation, right? Right. One group is the righteous. The other group is the wicked. Is that simple enough? Agreed. Okay. Now, now, what was Tess doing with her streams of information? Because Jeff is using them to represent two prophecies of Scripture. Is either Fox or CNN... Prophecies of Scripture. No. Yeah. So you can't make the analogy prophetically to say that that this is talking about two streams of information. Now, I was there when Tess, you know, presented these things. And... I remember specifically, so, you know, she was going through all these histories of these battles, um, uh, you know, with the elephants, right? 
And um, and then one time she just switched. She all of a sudden said, I'm going to go a different direction. And she started presenting a, uh, a conspiracy theory uh, or the way that conspiracy theories spread in her mind. Um, stuff, misinformation about Clinton or something like that, um, the Clintons. And, you know, I was sort of kind of taken aback a bit, you know, um, uh, one is her, her mannerisms had completely changed in this presentation. It was much more high energy than her other presentations. And um, so I started looking into what she was saying, uh, you know, what the things that she had talked about. I don't remember all the details, but it was pretty clearly evident that what she was doing was a misrepresentation of reality. Um, and then she, you know, she went from that to to talking about where our information comes from and that we need to trust um, the mainstream media, but not Fox. And I don't trust, well, anybody, right? <laughs> I always check up everything. So, I mean, I didn't trust Tess, um, but I don't trust anyone. I don't trust the media. I mean, the media, even if people have all the best intentions of the wor in the world, um, all you're going to get is biased reporting because it's humans. And, and, and even what you decide to report or not report is going to give a perspective of the world. So, um, but prophetically, there's just no connection. Now, also, we can see that in the Time of the End magazine, uh, it's pretty clear who the enemies are. In Tess's and Parminder's world, uh, there is no, you know, Jesuits um, uh, involved in trying to infiltrate either churches or governments or anything like that. But that's just a conspiracy theory. And we know that's not the case, right? So we know the Jesuits as the, basically the intelligence uh, of uh, the papacy, that they've always had this role. That's really why they were created, right? Correct? That's why St. Ignatius of Loyola, as they call him, Saint. Um, that's why he created the Jesuits in the first place, right? Correct. So this is well established, well documented throughout history, the role and purpose of the Jesuits. Doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of conspiracy theory stuff about the Jesuits that are not true, because there is a lot that are not true. Um, a lot of things made up, right? And I've read tons and tons of stuff about the Jesuits. Um, and you know, some of it's correct, some of it isn't. Uh, but we do know that the Jesuits, the end justifies the means. And, and Parminder acted like a Jesuit when he intentionally lied to get his position within FFA so that he could eventually take over the movement, right? So, I mean, he... And... He didn't hide the fact afterwards that he actually had to be deceptive. And, and to them, that was part of the whole the whole issue is that because we were conservatives who are the bad people, him being the good person had to use deception. Right. That's that's basically his argument. And of course, does God ever use deception? Who's the liar? So Satan is the, the father of lies. Right. And, and in a sense, God ties his own hands because God will not lie. But he's not really tying his hands because obviously only the truth can witness of the truth. A lie can never support the truth. So, um, so there's lots we have to delve into. And, and, and I'm going to try to find a little bit more about 
exactly what Mark Bruce said, if I can find it. Um, but uh, one thing we, we can say, so if we go back to here just to finish up our study for today, because um, we haven't gotten very far as far as drawing this line. We can see that there is this foundation that's being laid by Jeff. But there are things, Mark Bruce notices some inconsistencies, doesn't mean that you know what he did was correct as far as how he reacted when he was um, attacked in his mind. Um, but we know that as we zoom into these lines, we start to have this problem within this movement. But of course, the problem first that we have to get rid of is um, because we have to introduce the 2520. The 2520 is going to give us a key to understanding Millerite history deeper. And then we have to have uh, this understanding of the first day of the first month, the first day of the fifth month, and, and also the understanding that comes with chronology. So we start to unfold in that increase of light, that increase of knowledge through the Holy Spirit, this work of repentance. And, and we're going to address tomorrow a little bit more about uh, who this enemy is, because it's, it's in Mesopotamia, right? So we're going to have to address that. We just kind of we have to kind of spread out and look at this whole picture. Now we kind of have to bring it back together, right? So that's what we want to try to do tomorrow to get this understanding of Othniel, of what this work is, and then uh, Ehud and Shamgar, and how they they the role they play in this history um, prior to October thirteenth, because October thirteenth is is that way mark. So now um, this, this whole way mark here is gonna, gonna expand, right? So Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar have a place within the judges that's the arrival of the first message. But when we look at them separately, they're gonna span a larger period of time. And, and do we have pro problems with that? Taking something that's that in the line above is going to be, um, you know, they're going to occupy pi this place in this line, but now we're going to expand them and we're going to see that they extend a little bit further because once you expand a line, it starts to use way marks from other lines. So hopefully we can, we can do this tomorrow. <clears throat> Okay, so think about these things and we'll come back together uh, to look at these again tomorrow. So let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, we are very grateful uh, for the time again. And uh, we know that there's so much we don't understand and so many things that we've studied that we don't remember. And so we ask, Lord, that you can help us to recall these things as we think about them, as we look into them today in preparation for tomorrow and um, help each person in their personal study be with us throughout this day may your angels watch over and protect us until we come together again we pray and ask in jesus name amen